Welcome to Nerdstalker Tech Week podcast here. I am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerdstalker, and I'm with my uh, cohort here, this side over here. And well, for you. I'm Social Greg on Twitter, a.k.a. Ow. Greg Valoria. <laughs> 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 nice. Nice. Hey, I have a new look here, folks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, illuminated. How about that, huh? I am illuminated, yes, <laughs> yes. Now, our, you always had a natural nerd... halo about you, so it didn't, you know, whatever. Well, I I, uh, I am sweet. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but, um, but, <laughs> but, um, well, no, I, I thought, I, you know, now, now that you're paying me the big bucks, yes. I can afford little, little things like lights on this way, so Tiny uh, light I feel bulb. good about this. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I pay Greg yeah, in yeah. light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> hamster keep on going <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> anyway god uh it's it's been a good week i, I yeah. it's been an interesting week huh <laughs> i i saw your tweet the other day and what's this thing about google is making a home entertainment system they're getting in the hardware business yeah yeah it's all kinds of business news it seems this week yeah thanks to uh life hacker whitson gordon is the name of the writer he says google's making a home entertainment system complete with streaming music uh, and smart remote control. Wow. And so I bet you can guess where the smart remote control is going here. But the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Google, usually a software creator, is putting together an entertainment system for which they've designed both the hardware and the software. So uh, it would stream music from Google's online store and send it to either uh, to wireless speakers or other network computer uh, using smartphones or tablets as a remote control. Uh, we don't know much else yet, is what they're saying, besides the fact that they're aiming to release later this year. So pretty vague. It's a pretty big step for Google, though, uh, who usually makes uh, only makes the software for such devices, um, you know, so like the Android and Google TV, or uh, both of which exist on devices manufactured by other companies, right? So um, yeah, supposedly this is going to be all Google. So. We shall see. Well, it sounds like an Apple play, doesn't it? Yeah, Hello? exactly. They're, that's what, exactly what they were saying in the article, too. They're like, it's a very Apple-like move, but I, I don't want to mm. compare it to them until it gets to that <laughs> yeah, point, no. right? Because especially from what we've seen in the past, right? even close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or even the hardware. You know, a lot of the stuff that <laughs> yeah. the, the, the Google sorry. TV was, oh, my God, it was just a horrible, horrible thing. But, um, yeah, yeah. So. Well, I guess we got to oh, wait till end oh of year, God. and you know, by that, who knows what Apple will have released by end of year for the home media center or this, you know, yeah, unicorn of yeah. Apple t television that may or may <laughs> not be coming, whatever that even means. Yeah, yeah. ah, that's okay. So it's all right, not it's, a problem. All right. Yeah. So, Greg, what is up, Vivo? Yes. Vivo, what's this of Vivo news? This sounds crazy. You know, we talked about, you know, Vivo doing this, Vivo doing that, you know, going with Facebook, going away from YouTube. But, you know, so suddenly it was reported um, last week. Um, I, I saw it on uh, Arrington's Uncrunched and uh, also uh, he, uh, Mike Masnick from TechDirt uh, talked about this. But basically, you know, where's DOHS ICE team when you need them, right? Mm. <laughs> so, so they... Basically, what happened was that um, during a Super Bowl party, um, Vivo uh, execs streamed the Super Bowl illegally. <laughs> so, um, um, what? <laughs> uh, the, yeah. But, you know, I think they bring up a lot of good points in a lot of these articles is that, you know, um, wasn't I supposed to shut down things like this? Hmm. I, 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 you know, I see. But, but, but that's one side of the coin but the other side is that they're you know they're trying to now extradite um um the uh top execs from vivo to, uh, to the country to, from the uk to try to um you know press charges and you know errington um you know said you know they just basically got caught with their pants down and wow. you know tech crunches jason kincaid kind of reported about them you know legally streaming this nfl game at a party they hosted at the oh i'm sorry at the sundance festival so uh, it was an nfl uh. game I, it wasn't super bowl i apologize for that and um you know i think it's just interesting is there a dual standard here what's going on you know i think there was a lot of questions in the comments uh uh, about that, you know, uh, well, they could shut down any other one, but, you know, how come they're not touching Vivo? Is there something going on? 
Uh, no, it's interesting. I, I, oh. If they could press charges, the, the, you know, Michael Arantin says is that it's five years minimum. <laughs> wow! Wow! So they were so, so they someone said, was actually streaming a Sundance video or movie or something like no, that. No, no, an NFL game at a at party Sundance. hosted at the Sundance. At yeah. Some, okay, so, I see. Okay. So, so the NFL game is owned by the nfl correct and they were streaming it wow. <laughs> it was just you know that's that's uh, a trick because mean, usually like uh you know people have been known that i've heard of uh to go to like justin tv and, and you stream to look like look for things like uh, i don't know pay-per-view ultimate yeah. fighting you know uh uh bouts let's say for instance all the time and uh you see those guys uh getting shut down rather quickly they're very diligent about you know stopping yeah. that type of stuff so that's super surprising that um whatever service they were using was i wonder if it was vivo whatever they were using to stream this thing uh didn't catch um, that and stop it you know yeah, I'm sure it was. I, you know, and, and but it, it's it's this. I think it's also uh, speaks of censorship. You know, how much can you really censor, mm. and how efficient can you be with the with the with the crawlers that you have on your side? Mm. You know, you, obviously you don't have people doing it, right? Mm. And and um, you know, Chinese. Uh, when I talked to a lot of the people on the Chinese side, which is the famous <laughs> um, uh, firewall, right? Mm. You, mm-hmm. you know, they have robots. Crank, you know. Uh, climbing all over the place, but they, right. they just can't keep up with the content yeah. that's out there. You know, there's some that are going to just get out. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I got a couple of pieces this week uh, quoting Arrington, so we'll, we will we will see later what we have left here. Cool. But um, anyway, let's, let's move on to the next one. I think uh, we got also um, the Silicon Valley where we live is recovering faster than the nation, huh? Yeah, so this is by uh, Pu Wing Tam, I believe, of uh, it was a Wall Street Journal or something like that. Uh, what, he, what he's saying is even before Facebook Incorporated goes public, uh, Silicon Valley already is experiencing a surge in jobs and per capita income uh, in contrast to the weak you know, economic situation dog in the rest of the nation. Um, so according to a new closely watched report in Silicon Valley that came out Tuesday of, uh, must have been last week or a couple weeks ago, the region added a total of 42,000 jobs last year, up 3.8% mm. from nice. 2010 and bringing the area's workforce back to its 2006 and seven levels of 1.2 million people. The job growth was largely fueled by the technology industry, uh, was faster than the 1.1% increase elsewhere in the nation. Uh, the wow. annual report is compiled by nonprofits, Joint Venture, Silicon Valley Network, and the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Okay. At the same time, Silicon Valley's unemployment rate dropped to 8.3% at the end of 2011, down 1.4 percentage points from a year earlier, even as California's overall unemployment rate hovered uh, at around 11%, according to the report. And per mm. capita income in the region also rose last year to around $66,000, up 4% from a year earlier. Okay. Uh, sorry about okay. all the math, but still the increases in job and per okay. capita income mass some weaknesses in Silicon Valley's economy. In particular, the tech boom. Mm. This is a really interesting point here. Uh, so okay. it's masking okay. this weakness. In particular, the tech boom's benefit uh, appears increasingly confined to small sets of well-educated and highly skilled denizens, is what they're saying, with many high-tech companies no longer creating the tiers of mid-range jobs that they used to, yeah, exactly. uh, said Mr. Hancock. Uh, he says, quote, tech used to be uh, the tide that would lift all boats, right? And uh, But it's, t- it's no time to be popping corks now. Um, he noted that while per capita income in Silicon Valley rose last year, median income fell 3% over the last over the Ooh. past year and has been on the decline for a while. High income households holds form 43% of the regions, uh, the region and are growing, he added, but the medium income household bracket is shrinking. Um, if you yeah, take away right. tech sil- from Silicon Valley, he says that we still, we look like any other region and we, in fact, we even look more stressed than some other places. Sure. Sure. No, I, I, you know, I think last decade, from what I remember, I think the low was in the four to five percent region, right, for mm. unemployment, right, mm. uh, and so eight point three is still kind of high relatively to that. But, but I, I agree with you. I, I would, with what you just said, is that, um, you know, there's this big gap between service. 
the service sector and this high tech sector here in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I think that's where that's where this this thing is going, right? Yeah. And also <laughs> think, of particular yeah. interest too is like the the less of a need of this like middle management position or this middle position, right? So it used to be I mean that yeah. provided a lot of opportunities for for people Absolutely. that weren't like a really low end and weren't like super high skilled too or you know super high tech or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so. me well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know so and we need more of that kind of stuff right for people so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so greg so sweet yes. you know i apologize and apparently so does uh path what's going on here <laughs> yeah this was oh, huge news oh, right man. yeah this is huge news so the, the the social sharing app which has really been popularized you know um you know path has come under fire for accessing and um uploading users phone address books without their permission and that this this came up uh, through a tweet uh, reported uh, by the AP on Twitter, thanks to uh, Yuri Kagiyama from the Tokyo AP News Bureau reporting um, that, you know, PATH dubs itself as a personal network, letting users use shared photos, videos, and updates with close friends, right? Uh, I think you use PATH as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I love it. And Yeah, and, you know, it prides itself on strict privacy controls, right? And so, <laughs> you know... Uh, what had happened is that, you know, um, or so you thought they just, yeah, they uploaded all users phone address books without their permission. And so now, you know, and so Arrington, you know, got on it, you know, it, I didn't realize this, but path is a crunch fund company. Yeah. Yeah. Crunch fund, Arrington, crunch fund, yeah. Arrington. So, uh, on Arrington's blog that same day, <laughs> the title of his blog said, Hey path, just nuke the data, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you know. That's I think prudent. One point in, yeah, and they did obviously, and and Arrington actually one point that Arrington brought up that I thought I wanted to key on here was, you know, he said this is a common problem with apps, due in large part that Apple doesn't really consider the data as sensitive, say like location information hmm. so to get location info the app must alert the user to get their permission on the screen right hmm. there's no such requirement really for the address book data can you believe that wow <laughs> yeah and you know it brings up a good point i mean you know and i think i don't know i like to hear your your opinion on this but i think also the speed and the development that I see with these app guys trying to get to market, right, right. I could see a lot of these things falling through the cracks. I, I, what do you think? Well, you know, the, the tr tragic part about this one is when Path 1.0 re was released, everyone was like, what is this? And why do I need another photo sharing <laughs> app or whatever this thing? Yeah, why do I care? So that was sort of like death number one, right? So, And mm. then somehow, you know, you rarely ever see this. They somehow, you know, changed their business, their app, I guess, let's just say. And, uh, and then it became kind of compelling, this mini social network thing where you can control if it mm. fires off to your bigger social networks if you choose to do right. so. Um, but now we have this, you know, yet another strike, you know, with the, I guess this would be strike two maybe because, you know, um, the second attempt was rather successful. So we'll nullify that one. But this one is uh, a definite no, no. And you're right. I did not see any sort of option to for for me to select, hey, go ahead, raid all my contacts and throw it to a <laughs> to some Singaporean server, you know, data farm or something <laughs> like that. No, I did not. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, I mean, yeah, some large scale cl cloud infrastructure, you know, had had some sort of data centers that weren't in the United States or your country where you dwell right now anyways. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what what they're doing with that data, I think, is of more yeah. of more interest to me than than that. Yeah. Yeah, I would hate for my friends. Facebook. Oh, sorry, friends, if you guys are getting con contacts now from you know, <laughs> That's right. who knows what. Yeah, like, yeah. my my yeah. tight social what? path network that was supposed to be private, right? <laughs> <laughs> from those uh, plus uh, country codes that you see on yeah. your cell phone, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yikes. Yeah, yikes. Oh, man. Hey, um, you know, this is a pretty good trend in the last couple of years. Yeah. You, you had a good tweet on um, car sharing networks changing the way we travel. I, I, I thought that was a great 
uh, tweet that you sent out cool. this week. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm super, uh, super interested in this, uh, this next story here. Uh, mm. the, well, the big part of this story is okay. I use well. I, I'm a member. I haven't. I have yet to use it, but I know people who have of the service called Relay Rides, right? And um, mm, it's it's right. sort of a social car sharing type of service, which we'll talk about. But all of a sudden, GM has put a, a huge investment into uh, Relay Rides, uh, General Motors. That is right. Oh. So, uh, so the story is, uh, uh, why would, you know, why would the largest car company partner, tiny, well, partner with a tiny little known startup that could cannibalize its business by promoting car sharing instead of new car buying? Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah. So, so according to GM's vice chairman, uh, Steve Gursky, the reason GM recently led a $3 million round of funding for relay rides, uh, of a, of a growing number of so you know, so-called peer-to-peer car sharing services in the U.S. is that, mm, quote, mm. our business is really mobility, uh, moving people around. In other words, what matters most is that more people are driving around in GM vehicles, uh, whether or not they, they own them. Uh, and San Francisco-based Relay Rides, which encourages people to lend their personal cars to strangers for an hourly fee, has the potential to help them in that regard. Uh, proponents of peer-to-peer car sharing say it could easily outstrip traditional car sharing services like Zipcar over time. Whereas uh, Zipcar either owns or leases the 9,500 right. vehicles in its fleet, peer-to-peer right. car sharing companies like Relay Rides get around and newcomer just share it, which uh, launches January in San Francisco as well. Let people rent out their own autos uh, to others at rates you know set by the car mm-hmm. owners themselves. With uh, more mm-hmm. than 250 mil- million vehicles already on the road today, that's an enormous pool to choose from. Uh, from is this sort of business model? What they're saying. A 2010 mm-hmm. report from Frost and Sullivan estimated that some 4.4 million people will join car sharing networks by 2016 in North America. Uh, even so, Relay Rides is likely likely to wow. become the uh, the bigger uh, to get a biggest be the bigger player right now because they're getting this huge boost right now. Um, yeah. From this partnership, GM's gearing up to begin promoting relay rides to the five million active users of its OnStar and vehicle security and navigation services. Spring, aha! Uh, relay rides members will be able to use their smartphones to find OnStar enabled cars that are available for rent. Uh, considering the relay rides yeah. network of vehicles currently consists of just two hundred cars in San Francisco and Boston, the partnership promises to dramatically increase both the quality and the quantity of the cars in its network and help the peer to peer car sharing into into mainstream, right? To push this all into the mainstream. Uh the idea makes business sense too. Uh because a peer to peer car sharing service doesn't have to pay for the vehicles that they ran out. All these That's serv- true. service service you know service fees uh or, or their upkeep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the potential right. for uh much higher profit margins in traditional car sh- sharing right. services and can okay. operate more like an online marketplace such as eBay. When you look at traditional car sharing or rental services, what's interesting is how much uh, the money they drained out by fleet maintenance. Now, this this is really interesting here. Um, mm. Which uh, uh, For Zipcar, which reported its first pre-tax uh, quarterly profit in late 2011, fleet maintenance costs nice. accounts for about 65% of its total expenses. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's huge, yeah, right? And according to a 2011 report from uh, AAA, the annual cost of owning and ma- maintaining a new car for individuals ranges anywhere from uh, about 7,000 bucks for a small sedan to uh, about 12,000 bucks for an SUV. Uh, nice. For many people, Investor Kraus says, is their car is the largest uh, depreciating asset that they own, of course, right? Uh, yeah, the toughest yeah. part of it is getting past um, people not wanting to share who wants to share their car who wants to share your stuff right so you go yeah exactly. you know, airbnb had this sort of challenge too right it's insurance policy yeah. but but what they've done is uh they've they got this insurance policy uh which includes a million dollars in liability oh, coverage I see. I see. for injury so, to oh. others or vehicles plus collision and so theft. you don't have to take that on oh right okay, right okay. so they're throwing that on oh, yeah they, oh, they're giving oh, you theft oh, collision okay. uh injury oh, uh wow. for the value of the rented vehicle minus a 500 dollars to talk deductible paid by the renter because relay rides policy is separate from the owner's personal coverage damage incurred by renters doesn't get reported on the owner's personal carrier that's no, awesome i was gonna ask yeah. about that yeah because I, I god i was thinking <laughs> that state farm would just be licking their chops yeah right yeah now. <laughs> uh yeah so like you know the thing the thing with their business model 20 percent of their hourly rental goes toward uh insurance right and relay ride right, yeah. gets about fifteen percent, and uh, GM will right. get a cut for cars rented out with its OnStar type of stuff, right? So Steve Morris of San Francisco says he rented a, uh, his his twenty ten Ford Escape sixty eight times via relay rides, 
uh, since March 2011, earning about 2800 bucks through January of this year. So this helps him with his insurance okay. payments and blah, blah, blah. He says, you yeah. know, cover all that stuff. How great is that? Uh, so so what they're saying, too, is to give owners additional peace of mind, relay rides, cars are equipped with GPS systems that keep tabs on the whereabouts at all times, and the ignition is disabled if someone other than the designated renter tries to start the car. Renters currently unlock the car by holding a card embedded with the RFID chip up to the card reader installed in the car window. Once the OnStar program oh, okay. launches, uh, you can be able to do that via your smartphone app both owners and renters can rate each other on the on the site like uh, ebay or airbnb and uh, and relay rise has a ton of backing and funding so a very kind of interesting thing that for us to watch is it looks like this whole business model is in its infancy so greg freelancers it seems yes. like it's a big business i'm seeing all these co-working spaces start to happen um oh, yeah. what's what's the story here this is a very interesting well yeah, it is. Uh, thanks to Dan Haugen from uh, Good.is, the, you know, the good business uh, site. Um, you know, you and I, we yeah. live in a tech hub that has many co-working spaces that have popped up here, like uh, Parasoma, Citizen Space, Rocket Space, just to name a few, right? And um, the concept in the past, you know, if you were ever traveling before all this happened, was that, you know, People used to have like, you know, go to major hotels and have like a shared business suite where, you know, if if you had one of the, you know, you were the club member or whatever, you could get access to their business suite and hook into the Internet, right? Well, there, there's another twist now in co-working spaces because typically co-working spaces these days are localized, right? They're just in your town and there's just one of them and you just pick the one you want to go to. You have a startup. You, you could share in all the infrastructure there, right? Well, there's a new concept uh, for people to work outside their office anytime, any place. So last week, um, uh, co-working space Coco and five other uh, U.S. co-working spaces announced they formed this league of extraordinary co-working spaces called LEXC, cool. <laughs> which, <laughs> which means they will honor each other's memberships and let users reserve spaces online. So basically, it's now turned into a network. Um, the move is aimed at, you know, part making it easier and more appealing for larger companies to get into the game, you know. So, you know, you have a, you know, you, you get a membership at a, you know, your local place. You get a membership for all your employees, Very right? Cool. And then you can make a lot of money that way. Yeah, really cool idea. And then as I travel to, you know, from San Francisco to Boston and I want to go, you know, pick up the internet or wow. just hook my laptop in, you know. I mean, you know, it's that makes still, sense. you know, I could do it from my hotel, but, you know, maybe it might be good if I could go to a co-working space, especially maybe if there's, other companies there I want to um, network with, yeah. so on and so forth. It just makes a lot of sense. So, um, so I kind of like it. You know, there's a lot of upside to this business. You know, they in this report, nine percent of regular users in the U.S. Uh, co-working spaces already work for companies more than 100 employees. So, mm. according to some research there, yeah. and you know, but there are more than a billion mobile workers worldwide, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, sure. so about 40 percent, 45 percent of the U.S. jobs uh, could be done with at least part-time telework. They said so. You know, tremendous upside. I think the teleworking um, nature with a lot of these mobile devices is just you know, it's just starting to take off now. And yeah. I, I think it's a great concept they came up with here. Yeah. Like, yeah. It reminds me of, um, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple of things here. You know, I, I talk to a lot of freelancers, okay. people that work from home and I'm always yeah. blown away. They always tell me, you know, I can't do it. I can't work from home anymore. This is driving me crazy. I need to be around some people. And so they go and they join these co-working spaces, whether it's for a day, a week or whatever, you know, and they love it mm -hmm. and they love it. And uh, yeah, as you nice. mentioned, Greg, they're popular here. There's a, a whole bunch of amazing ones here in san francisco and uh it's it, it reminds me of this sort of like you know kind of rental call car business model like if you can go from city to city and and if you're a vip member or whatever some sort of member you can right, right. use your vehicle get priority or, or whatever it is right and uh with this yeah that makes perfect sense how that's a great idea yeah i i i I, I think, you know, let's see what happens and yeah. see if they could capitalize on it. Because I think, you know, some of these co-working spaces, especially here in San Francisco, they're 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 close to 100 yeah. percent booked now. Right. Yeah, so yeah. 
So Amazing. it's going to be interesting, how, you know, if they could utilize, let's say if they're 93% utilized, you know, they could easily get that 7% back to 100% by just doing something like this. So right. it's kind of nice. And plus their name yeah. is awesome. The League of Extraordinary, whatever it is, co-working spaces. Or whatever. Yeah. Lex. <laughs> Lex <Yeah>. Luthor. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I thought that was yeah. that was really cool. cool. So, so Greg, tip know. time. Yeah. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Should I go first? Yeah, you go first, Greg. Do it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, um, thanks to, um, again, Harold Deeming, um, uh, a Twitter follower of mine on Social Greg, uh, at I4Harold. He tweeted this out the other day, and I, I just thought this was great. Get get up to 4.5 gigabytes of extra space on Dropbox for uploading photos and videos. And I, I thought that was great. And oh, thanks right. to yeah. Live Packer, uh, Melanie Panola, uh, who – who wrote the article. Uh, uh, the article goes on and says, that now for a special beta period, you can grab some additional free space while Dropbox is testing their automatic photo and video uploading feature. Yeah. In exchange for trading out their experimental build, their beta build, you can get up to 4.5 gigs of extra space for free. So uh, uh, cool. the Dropbox you know, site says that during the beta period, we're also offering additional free space to test automatic uploading of photos and videos. Sweet. For every 500 megabytes of photos and videos automatically uploaded, you'll receive 500 megabytes space bonus up to wow. 4.5 gigabytes. So go do it, folks. Special short period of time here, but mm-hmm. you could get some uh, Dropbox uh, love and Dropbox space. So. Interesting. Interesting that they're going with that. Yeah. You know, a couple things. You get an extra space for trying out their beta stuff, so we're the guinea pigs, plus that yeah. they're doing that instant <laughs> stuff and your photos get to go to the cloud. Now they're becoming kind of a photo play. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, I like your tip too. What's yeah, this man. thing about So the another ways? yeah, yeah another like another life hacker uh, tip here thanks to Adam uh, Dacus of this. I love wow. Waze. I use Waze on the Android and uh oh, okay. it's it is my favorite GPS uh solution out there right now. It's not a widely okay. known well it seems like it's I, I, you know most people i hear they're using google maps and they just use the directions on google yeah. maps to drive around but seriously yeah, i highly maps. recommend yeah. using ways um so okay. so if you're an iphone user you're in luck ways for iphone just added a great new feature hands-free operation so now you can control ways with a wave of your hand and the power of your voice how it works here's the gist you can enable ways okay. to respond to either a three finger tap or uh, just a wave of your hand over the screen. So sleep now, you know. When you perform one of these actions, Waze will then load its voice control functionality and prompt you for input. You can report traffic condition, ask for directions, notify others that you're running late, and uh, tell them if there's police traps, um, and more. It's uh, pretty awesome and is, as always, another free feature in the already great free app. Uh, The latest version of Waze is rolling out in the iTunes App Store. Uh, It actually already did, I believe. Android users, unfortunately, we have to uh, wait for this in the next coming months. So, hey, man, <laughs> events, what's happening, man? What's in the SF New Tech? Boom. Hey, SF New Tech this Wednesday, folks. Right around the corner. Uh, February 15th, uh, right day after Valentine's Day. Uh, we didn't do anything for Valentine's Day, I noticed. No, but anyway. Yeah. Um, Last week yeah. I mentioned something. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, um, Tianji uh, is going to be uh, sponsoring this, which is uh, you know which was acquired by Via Deo in 2007. It's now the China's number one professional social network with over 8 million members and growing at a rapid place, pace. They say. So uh, we have uh, six uh, now um, uh, demos going on uh, from China and. Uh, uh, one is uh, one is very popular. Um, a dolphin, actually, they're going yes. to China. I'm yes. sorry about that. Um, you know, Edith Young, uh, you know, uh, aka BizTech Day, and and um, a local uh, TV uh, celebrity uh, is going to be uh, presenting for them. Uh, so that's going to be kind of cool to see. That's one of the notables uh, on the list. But you yeah. know, you know, it, doors open at 5:30. There's still tickets left. Um, and we'll start the pre-show on Ustream if you can't make it at seven o'clock, and we'll start the demos on both Ustream and at Mighty 119 Utah Street at 7:30. So right on. You know, be there, be square. And don't forget, people, it's SF New Tech forward slash live if you want to hear Greg and see the show or buy tickets. Go to SF Absolutely. New Tech. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So also, yeah, if you. you guys want to contribute to any stories, please use the hashtag on Twitter, uh, hashtag NRDSTK. That is the little pound symbol there, if you don't know. And uh, go to nerdstalker.com. 
uh, for for more information and go to iTunes and subscribe for our audio or video podcast and please give us a rating that always helps with you know bump us up in these you know in the display of search and that kind of stuff and we would love that and uh, check us out on YouTube if you want just to watch the videos or whatever and uh, search for Nerd Stalker TV all one word Nerd Stalker TV so if you want to get a hold of me I am Adolfo at nerdstalker.com you can find me on Twitter as mentioned before at nerdstalker how about you Greg uh, on, on Gmail, you can reach me at socialgregsf at gmail.com or on Twitter at socialgregsf. Uh, also, I want to give a shout to our Japanese contingent. Ah, yes. uh, we're getting a lot of tweets there. In fact, it was really kind of funny. Awesome. I'm finding out that some of them are using it to learn English. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Is man. that cool or what? <laughs> to look <us>. yeah. <laughs> But yeah. anyway, I want to give a special shout out to A.G. Uh, Shinohara, who's been really good about tweeting out about our 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 um, our podcast to all Thank his uh, so friends and family and uh, co-workers at a big company in uh, Tokyo Japan so Excellent. anyway my love out to them and uh, we'll catch you guys next week yeah thanks for watching everyone and all listening right. be careful out there <laughs>